where they don't have a food source, they're, they're probably a natural die off. Their numbers are probably diminishing and then increasing again in the winter months when the soil is wet and a lot of organic matter is breaking down, creating a food source for them. Um, but yeah, they, they probably just dive deeper underground. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay, so we got a little bit into the, the why, why to do it. You can make basically the, the best quality compost you could possibly make. Um, it's also a good way of reducing, uh, you know, diverting uh, green waste so it's not ending up in a landfill. Yeah, you can give it, I think in California now in the next few years they're gonna be rolling out green waste, uh, curbside green waste for all places. Who has green waste? That I think probably has it now. I'm in Ramona, we've, we've had it for a few years now. Um, but, um, so one of the things, it's not gonna take care of all your green waste, um, and that is one of the tricks to being successful with the worms is you want to be a little bit selective about what you feed your worms and so it's even a smaller list of things that should go in your worm bins um, versus what can go even in a, a compost pile outside. So one of the major differences between vermicomposting and doing um, a traditional aerobic composting is um, aerobic composting you kind of have to worry about the carbon and nitrogen ratio a little bit you're really just shooting for about one to three and carbon uh, is like browns, uh, so dead leaves, twigs, um, sorry, leaves that are, that are, that are dry. Uh, greens are basically grass clippings, uh, fresh leaves. Um, and so for a hot compost pile, you need to kind of dial in your carbon and nitrogen ratio. And the other major difference, it needs to get wet, so you need moisture in the process. Um, and it's a thermophilic composting, so it's actually there's bacteria breaking down organic matter um, as they're breaking carbon bonds, they're actually releasing energy, which is why a compost pile heats up. And a good compost pile should heat up to about 100, 120 degrees. Um, we don't want that process happening when we do it with worms because the worms will cook. So it's a, it's a different thing. We're not, um, and that's one of the reasons why it's actually easier to keep worms. You don't actually need to turn this, the compost. The worms are going to be doing the tilling for you. Um, and in fact, that's one way your worm bin can go wrong is if you treat it too much like a, like a aerobic composting pile, then again, it heats up, cooks the worms, the worms are not happy. Um, but then again, the trade-off is we let the worms do the tilling. Now, um, because it's not heating up, uh, there are certain pathogens that won't break down. So one thing we don't want to be feeding our worm bin is primarily we're going to be feeding them food scraps from our kitchen and we don't want to feed them any kind of meat or dairy products. Uh, cooked food, you have to be careful about. It really depends what's in it. I would say if it's, uh, in general, what are the things you do want to feed them are raw vegan food scraps. So any kind of fruit or vegetable matter. Uh, the one exception to vegan is eggshells are great. Eggshells don't need to be dried out first. Um, now, anything you feed them needs to be kind of chopped on the smaller side. Uh, or for eggshells, usually when I'm just making eggs for myself in the morning, I'll actually crush the eggshells. I keep a little plastic container on my kitchen counter, and then I feed that to the worms later. So, and the reason why is you're not going to do any heavy tilling or turning of the pile, and uh, the worms, again, will be able to turn the material, but it'll, it'll break down faster and better if, uh, if you're not, if you're actually chopping small. So usually if I'm like, if I'm peeling banana, to throw in a smoothie all so you, I'll, I'll chop the the banana peel into smaller chunks for instance and then throw it in my worm bin it's just, it's just setting habits like that um the other thing you'll typically want to avoid putting in because it's also not heating up to the extent that an aerobic compost pile would would be you want to avoid putting in things that are going to seed prolifically so it's usually squash family stuff like cucumbers uh or tomatoes it's not gonna hurt the compost any, but if you if you throw things like uh, tomato seeds in your worm bin, you will then get volunteer tomatoes in all of your plants that get all of your worm compost. Um, because it won't actually break it down. Versus an aerobic compost pile heats up enough that it's gonna kill most of the seeds. So that's another major difference. And so you don't, yeah. You mentioned not to use cooked vegetables. So like when I make a vegetable stock, 
the spent vegetables I would throw into the pile. So is that not good after school, of course? Oh, uh, no, you, you could. You could absolutely. After it's cooled down, you could absolutely okay. do that. I, I would say in general for cooked food, the rule is, I, and I fed them like rice and stuff before, that's totally fine. Grains that are going bad, if you have moldy bread, all that stuff's fine mm -hmm. to feed to the worms. Um, any, you can break the rule about it being vegan besides the eggshell rule. Anything that's heavy in meat and dairy or really oily kind of foods, I would avoid feeding into the worm bin. Anything that's more vegetable or grain based, um, even if it's starting, especially if it's starting to go bad, that's fine to feed to the worms. Yeah, yeah great question. Uh -huh. For uh, you know, uh, perpetuating and remediating fungi, sure. Um, specifically, so um, that's going to get pasteurized or sterilized before I uh, use it as as spawn to the fungi. So um, does it matter now that I'm I'm using? Uh, can I just throw a bunch of tomatoes in there and then watermelon seeds and squash and stuff? And like, um, since it's going to get cooked anyway and basically kill the, it's not going to like that's that that volunteer uh, plants isn't going to be a problem. I don't see why not. In your case, that should be fine. Uh, and then actually, and so this is actually brings forth an interesting question. So the main argument for um, especially homemade worm castings is the biological activity you're bringing. But because there's a lot of biological activity, it's going to have a lot of trace nutrients and a lot of enzymes in it. So even if you were to then pasteurize or sterilize the end product, and this is really the value of uh, worm castings on our bag. These, these, there is some biological activity and stuff like this still. Um, but it has a lot of tremendous benefits, even beyond um, like an anaerobic compost, um, even after it's been bagged or pasteurized or processed. It's still a uniquely different product than it is from anaerobic compost kind of output. Um, but yeah, yeah in, in your case, that wouldn't matter. I just know that I've, when I first started doing worm castings, and I, I grow a lot of cacti and succulents, I had tomato volunteers popping up in all of my succulent yeah. pods. So many that yeah. it became quite a nuisance. So that's just one thing. If you want lots of volunteer tomatoes in your <laughs> garden, then by all means throw those things in. Harder seeds like watermelon may or may not, they probably would end up sprouting later on. Um, and really small seeds, like uh, if you have like cilantro or lettuce or something, a lot of other things I haven't really had a problem with. But it's, it's really like squash family stuff and, and tomatoes that I've had a problem. Um, so the other thing, raw, even raw veggies wise, that you kind of want to avoid just because they don't break down well are citrus peels. Aww. You can use citrus, avoid citrus peels. Um, uh, avocado uh, skin, for some other reason, doesn't break down well. And then usually um, anything related, oh, pe sorry, peppers is another one <laughs> that if you will, you'll get tons of pepper volunteers if you put pepper seeds in. So that's one that you probably want to avoid. Um, and another one, just practically speaking, because it doesn't break down well, anything garlic, onion related, those, they just don't break down well. And that kind of makes sense. Um, they naturally have a lot of antimicrobial compounds in them, which is one of the reasons why they have such a long shelf life. And so they just, even in a hot compost pile, sometimes can resist breaking down, but probably shouldn't go in a warm bin. Yeah. Do you put uh, shredded paper in there? Or I do. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's move on to talking about bedding. So bedding is just what the worms are going to actually be in. Um, and then I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here because I know some of the folks that produce worms commercially, this is what they use as one of their primary beddings. Normally, you don't want to use manures, um, which of course you wouldn't really be mixing kitchen. You want to keep your worm bins outside for the most part. Yeah. Um, I recommend in kind of a shady, cool area. Um, if you live in a climate that gets kind of cold, I live in Ramona, so my, my worm bins are in the shade of an oak tree near the side of the house. They get shade pretty much all day long. Um, and you want something like that where it's somewhat sheltered so they don't heat up too much, they don't cool down too much. Um, and then the exception, if you for some reason have um, any uh, her herbivorous animals on a farm, things like horse manure, for instance, you can actually use with worms. And a lot of the commercial worm producers are actually using that. Um, you wouldn't want to use anything like chicken or steer or manure. Yeah. So like say ivermectin or any kind of dewormer, is it going to... Yes. Okay. So that's, a, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. If the horses are being, or whatever livestock it is, are being fed deworming agents, it will actually impact your <laughs> vermicompost negatively. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Do you have to wait until the manure is dry? Uh, or can you, you don't. Them? Yeah, something in the, the, the yeah. If it's something like horse manure, you can actually use it just right off the bat. Yeah. How about goats? 
code? You know, code, I'm not sure. I would, and that's the other thing too, this is gonna be an experiment, because it's really, how you do your worm is gonna be based off what you consume in your household and what kind of byproducts you create that are your inputs, your feedstocks for your worm bins. So um, I would say anything that you're not sure of, try in small quantities. And then when you go to harvest or even just feed more into your worm bins, dig around, see how it's breaking down. See if you notice any side effects. And, and usually a balance of inputs is good too. You don't want it just to be like all one thing. So a really great input material as well as um, it can kind of serve as a bedding material, which we'll move on to next, is coffee grounds. You can overdo coffee grounds, but coffee grounds are a really good substrate. It's a good combination between it's kind of gritty and granular, but also um, holds a lot of moisture, it's kind of spongy. And so you don't want bedding that's like just pure coffee grounds, but if you go to a Starbucks or a local coffee joint, usually you can ask and they'll give out um, coffee grounds. So that's one way to get started if you need some bedding material, but I wouldn't use more than like maybe a quarter or a third coffee grounds in total. Uh, yeah, um, so anything that's not like a hot type manure, really coarse manure is the one that I know works well. Anything else I would be cautious of. You, the things you definitely don't want to use are like cow or chicken manure. Is that because of like E. coli or other things? Or um, is, is, uh, why, why coarse manure but not the other two? I th that could be a reason. The other thing is I think the way that um, certain animals digest the material, like if you look at coarse manure, it's, there's still a lot of grass and hay type or stuff in it that's not broken they're down. Not ruminant, that's why. They're not ruminant, okay. Awesome, so there's your answer. But it has to do with what's left over after in their poop, it still resembles more of like a, a raw grass or a raw type material. Like they're able to extract certain nutrients from it, but they still have a lot of those same fiber type compounds you would have in green waste. Non-ruminant means like digging around in their own. Um, no. Yeah, they won't have more yeah. So horses, most of it breaks down and comes out whole. And they, that's why they're constantly grazing, constantly grazing. Cattle, sheep are, and goats are a little different, but cattle specifically, they'll sit them, they'll eat, they'll lay down, they'll chew their cud, they'll vomit it up, they'll put it back down, and the bacteria in the room is what's breaking it down and makes it hot, it has a high EPK level or nitrogen versus that, so. Yeah, yeah that's, thank you so much. Um, and I think the reason why, the, so the ruminant animals are able to extract energy from cellulose, and the non-ruminant animals aren't. So there's a lot of that like fiber that's left over that looks like the grassy stuff in horse manure is still, it's all those cellulose bonds that can still break down and be composted, which is why it has that kind of structure and isn't already kind of like on the more liquid side of things. Yeah. What about tea? Tea? Yeah, you can use tea. Tea, tea is great for form compost. Again, it's, it's a little bit of an everything in moderation. Um, so let's talk about other bedding things. The one bedding thing I personally always use, uh, it's inexpensive, it works well, it's a great substrate in terms of holding moisture while also holding oxygen, is cocoa bar. 99% um, of the time it comes in blocks that need to be expanded, which can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. Um, you need some kind of like tub or bucket that does not leak from the bottom. And then you throw one of these blocks in and then you add a bunch of water, and then you add a drop of Dawn dish detergent. Just one drop. Yeah, so basically you're just throwing this whole thing in like a wheelbarrow or a bucket or something, submerging in water. It's gonna absorb something like four or five times its volume in water. So you don't wanna throw all the water in right away, but you're gonna throw in more water than you think you need and there will still be dry, it will suck it all up and start to break apart, and then you'll still probably need to add more water. You wanna throw in also one drop of something like dish detergent, just one drop. And all that's doing is it's water's a polar compound, meaning it likes to beat up. And if you add something, uh, a surfactant, it'll basically let the water uh, form smaller beads and therefore better penetrate something that's dry. So something like these blocks, they're pretty hydrophobic, it takes a little bit of effort to try to re-wet re them. It's good if you use that like a trowel or some kind of digging or scraping tool also to kind of go at the block. Um, once it's expanded, you can keep it in like, you can let it dry out or you can keep it in semi-moist form and it really won't go bad. Um, I just keep, I just have a bin where I can dig for a great, uh, add 
poke the board to my word bins at any time. And so another thing that's really good, especially if you have a paper shredder, you use shredded paper or newspaper or cardboard. Uh, you obviously wouldn't want to use something like the styrofoam packing peanuts, but every now and then if you get those boxes where they're using like the shredded cardboard type material, anything that'll, that'll compost that's paper products is good to use. And uh, another thing that I use, and this might not be an opportunity for everyone, I, I've never used pine needles, so I don't know how those would work. I, I feel like they might not break down well. You can use leaf litter. So I actually use oak leaf litter, which is a really, really great additive. Um, and it breaks down really nicely. And so usually I'm using, personally I'm using about equal parts, cocoa bar, paper shreds, and uh, leaf litter from under one of the oak trees. And when, so when I'm creating a new tray or adding onto a bucket, I, I have a tray system. I'll talk a little bit more about how you're actually going to house your worms in a little bit. Um, so when I'm creating a new tray, I'm usually mixing those three things equal thirds. Uh, and then I'm adding in anywhere from about one third to one half food scraps. Uh, you can add more of something like coffee grounds. So if you want to, you feel like equal equal parts, coca bar, newspaper shreds, leaf litter, and coffee grounds. And you'll get a sense of if it's a good texture. Um, in the long run, all of this is going to break down and become more wet over time, assuming you need to keep it moist. Um, and the really important thing, however it is that you're keeping your worms, you're going to have holes at the bottom of the container because you don't want it to get waterlogged at any point, and you want the option to be able to wet it or add more moisture if it's drying out. And the reason you don't want water is if you if it's if the tray can't drain through, then you can have anaerobic conditions, and anaerobic conditions favor anaerobic bacteria, bad stuff, things that can cause root rot. You'll, as with any other type of compost, you'll know if it's good compost if it smells kind of earthy and sweet. You'll know it's bad if it starts to smell sour or rotten or anaerobic. So the smell test, yeah, and you'll kind of get a nose for that as you start working with it. The smell test works on all compost, but especially, you know there's something wrong if you're getting sour or kind of septic odors. Are you kind of layering this stuff? Are you mixing it up or does it really matter? I usually just kind of mix it in a bucket and then I'll add it to a tray and then I'll usually dig the food scraps into kind of the middle of the tray. But it, it really doesn't, just find a system that works for you. It's really not too touchy. And the nice thing about it is the worms are going to find where the food is and they're then going to move it around. Because they're going to they're gonna eat some and poop it out somewhere else. And so it all kind of mixes together nicely. And then when you go to harvest your castings, always kind of know, oh, hey, what's breaking down? So if you're adding eggshells, that's one thing that is not actually going to break down. The eggshells are not going to compost. They're just adding calcium. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the importance of calcium in your worm bins. Um, but you'll notice that it really whatever size the eggshells were when you kind of crushed them up, they'll still be in your final product, and that's okay. They're the one thing that notably doesn't doesn't really break down, so you'll come across, oh, there's eggshells in this. Okay, that's fine. It's not a problem. I was, I was going to say this towards the end, but uh, uh, eggshells, speaking of, I had the question that can I just like grind them up into like fine powder? Yeah. And so let's talk about the importance. So the reason why you eat eggshells, you will want to add them is basically is everything breaks down. Any kind of composting process, um, and this is one actually one of the virtues of compost, especially in our soil. We're in an arid climate. Arid climates tend to have alkaline soil, and the reason why is it's the accumulation of. There can be various uh, geological things that cause acidic soil, but by and large, if you're in an arid climate, um, what happens is there's a lot of minerals naturally present in the soil things like magnesium and calcium that are alkali earth metals. And in a, in a arid, seasonally arid climate, what happens is when those, when we get rain, is because we have an extended dry season, as the, grind, the, the ground dries out during the warm season, it actually pulls some of those alkali earth salts to the surface. So if you ever see that crusty white stuff on the soil of the surface, or you go to the desert and you see that the desert actually has cracks in the desert, that's the presence of alkali earth metals, and that causes the soil to be alkaline. And so that's generally, arid climates have alkaline soil as, as a general rule. It's certainly true of ours. Um, it's not unusual for our soil around here to be as high as like eight on the pH scale, seven being neutral. It, it varies a lot, 
Now, adding organic matter, and so the other reason that arid climates, besides the, the evaporation of salts at the surface of the soil, the other reason why arid climates um, tend to have more alkaline soil, they tend to have less biomass accumulation. If you're in a place with lots of large trees uh, and, and just like more living plants, um, as those plants die and break down, they create compost naturally, they create humus, kind of forest soil, and any kind of composting reaction is going to be a naturally, at least slightly acidic reaction. So it's the presence of organic matter that actually can help moderate soil pH. So one of the virtues of compost to our soil, first of all, our, our native soil is generally very, very poor in organic matter, usually less than about like 3% naturally. Um, and a lot of the native plants have adapted and know how to live without that. And there are exceptions. If you like dig under an oak tree, you get like get some nice rich humusy soil. But in general, in the open area, just natively uh, around San Diego County, County, there's not going to be a whole lot of um, uh, organic matter. Our soil is very lean. It's mostly mineral. And so it's one of the reasons why compost improves our soil, improves any soil, but especially in our climate where we have uh, 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 soil that's so poor in organic matter, adding compost, whether it's hormone castings or something else, is really going to improve soil. And so the reason why we want to add calcium and why you could blend up, I'm lazy so I don't do that with my eggshells. I have another thing, but that, that's a good idea. It's, uh, and I'll tell you why. So the reason we want to add calcium is because the, um, the breakdown of organic matter in our worm bins, and, and to be clear, what's happening is the, the things we add to our worm bins are naturally decomposing and the worms are eating the bacteria. So they're actually not feeding off the food stuffs directly, they're feeding off the things that are breaking down the food, the food scraps. And in so doing, they actually create more of those same bacteria and help accelerate the process at which all those food scraps break down. So because it is a composting process, it has a slightly acidic reaction, and a little bit of that is okay. It's fine for it to be slightly acidic, but what we really want to do is we want to steer it to be a more neutral reaction, and we do that by adding calcium. Calcium being alkaline, so eggshells help. If you were to grind them up, they would help more. Um, what I recommend doing, and my number one recommendation, is adding azomite, which is a volcanic rock dust that's high in calcium. It's also really rich in a lot of other minerals. And or oyster shell. And you're just adding like a tablespoon or two and mixing it around with your bedding material every time you top off your bin. So a little bit goes a long way. And that just makes sure that you don't have a pH dive that it doesn't your conditions don't become really really acidic sorry i missed how much you're adding to a tablespoon or two to i don't know some arbitrary amount okay. yeah i think an eggshells will help it's not it's not i don't have my formulas are not very scientific but again it's a lot of experimentation do what works for you this is actually a powder so you could get by with using less of it this is going to be anywhere from like uh, maybe two millimeter pieces that are sharp to like a lot of fines, so it's more mixed grade. So this you want to use a little bit more of, yeah. So can we um, use um, shellfish? That was really shellfish. Yeah. If you were able to grind them up, yeah. That's that's really all this is. This is oyster shell that's been ground up. But like uh, shrimp and. Oh yeah. So actually, I'll talk about that. So this is these are also calcium rich things. These are another additive that I recommend you. It, so, who's heard um, anecdotally that if you give your hibiscus worm castings early in the spring, it won't get white fly? Yeah? Who's experimented with that, using worm castings as a predator against white fly? Yeah, I've heard mixed success on it too. Um, what I do know is there is some science behind it, and so I did some digging on this. Why does that work? There should be a good scientific explanation, not just anecdotal evidence. And the reason why is when you have worm castings, even in bagged form, because of the process of the worm uh, composting, you're again creating a whole ecology. The worms are kind of at the top of the food chain in that system. And you're gonna have a lot of little micro arthropods, like little, they're like roly polies, but even smaller, just constantly digging in the soil. They're about the size of a grain of sand. And all of those micro arthropods, um, all, all insects and other arthropods, things like um, pill bugs and that kind of thing, as well as uh, crustaceans from the ocean, they have one thing in common about their exoskeleton, which is their exoskeleton is made up of a compound called chitin. It's spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. It's chitin, it's pronounced chitin. And uh, the presence of chitin in soil will invite bacteria that breaks down chitin 
it produces an enzyme called chitinase, which helps dissolve chitin. And it seems like the benefit of adding worm castings to something like hibiscus to defend against white fly, it does two things. So for pests that reproduce in the soil that have a reproductive, uh, part of the reproductive life cycle is in the soil, um, if you have lots of chitinase produced by bacteria from uh, things that have been breaking down chitin, it'll help dissolve the shells of those kinds of creatures. And so it'll actually prevent um, uh, those kinds of pests from getting out of control because it'll naturally deplete the shells off their backs. The other thing that chitin seems to do as well as chitinase and the other related compounds is in a lot of plants they can actually sense the presence of it. It's a chemical messenger. Um, and they sense the presence of chitin and they'll up their natural immune system against it. So there's a benefit, the same benefit of feeding worm castings to hibiscus to prevent white fly. If you're making your own worm castings, do that. You can actually kind of supercharge, you can actually use these just as a fertilizer product and get similar results. Uh, I do a lot of talks on cactus succulents and things like mealybug and scale are really common on a cacti. I've sold a lot of people on using this. I've been using it in my own gardening practices. I used to fertilize all my cactus succulents strictly organically and then I started moving to kind of a blended process. But um, this is something I still use a lot. I, I basically give all my plants crab meal at the beginning of the growth season every year and I find it really does keep the insect flow down. Um, these are also both rich in calcium so you can also add some of these directly into your work bin. Eventually, your worm bed, you'll notice little things crawling around in the soil, microarthropods, and so you'll have the natural presence of chitin. But uh, to get started or to supercharge your worm castings, you can actually add some. The major difference you're going to find between crab meal and shrimp meal, shrimp meal breaks down a lot faster. So especially don't overdo it, because again, if you don't want to add too much nitrogen to your worm bins, you don't want it to cook, crab meal breaks down a lot slower. It's usually my preference. Um, because it breaks down slower and therefore it lasts longer. And how much would you put in here? Um, just a small handful. Yeah. And again, it'll also serve a similar purpose to adding something like azomite or oyster shell where you're adding a little more calcium in the mix. The other reason I like um, these products, they're essentially pure chitin from the respective animals that they come from. And uh, not only does it add calcium, but it adds magnesium. So if you've heard of using like Calmac type products, especially on things like tomatoes or other cash crops, um, usually having a good blend of calcium and magnesium is a good thing. And so that's, you're adding a little more magnesium into the mix because this is, it's uh, chitin, the natural formula that contains calcium as well as magnesium. Another thing you can do to kind of supercharge your worm castings, uh, who's done, anyone here done compost tea before? Played around with compost tea? So it's another thing you can do. Um, again, you can use something like worm castings purchased here out of the bag to make warm tea, there's enough biological activity in it. And that's essentially, who's, who's not heard of this compost tea? So compost tea is, uh, it's a way to kind of quickly and rapidly multiply the bacterial content of beneficial bacteria to then feed to your plants. Uh, the way compost tea usually works is you get something like a five gallon bucket, you fill it about two or three gallons full of water, and then you add a little bit of molasses, usually about half a cup, quarter of a cup of molasses, and then you put some worm poop in a sock, like an old sock, and then you soak it in there, and usually you have an air stone or an aerate or something that's injecting oxygen into the system, like an old uh, fish, fish aquarium uh, air pump, and what will happen is uh, you'll notice kind of bacterial slime starting to form, usually you let it bubble for about a day or two, and uh, what's, what's happening is you are culturing all of the microbes that are naturally present on the worm castings um, in the water. And the food source then is, is molasses, which you can break down and feed. And then you then use that tea to go water plants, thereby biologically inoculating them with the same bacteria that were naturally present in the worm casting, good bacteria. A variant of that, most recipes you'll see for making compost tea, are you'll throw some kelp meal in. Um, kelp meal is, it's got plant hormones in it. It's basically like good, good plant hormones, but um, it's also known as a microbial stimulant. So if you, you can add this directly into your worm cast, uh, your worm bins in small quantities and or use it for, for worm tea. Um, you'll see most worm compost recipes, the simplest of them are, are just worm castings and molasses bubbled in water, 
and then the next thing that's usually added in is calpanilin. And so, and actually, there's a little bit of a side note here, but um, if you want to learn more about what's living in your soil and what should be living in your soil, actually, I think we might still have some for sale on the far end. There's an awesome book called Teeming with Microbes that looks into the food soil web. Um, and a lot of their work is actually based off the work of a, a scientist, Dr. Elaine Ingham, yes. who coined the, the word, uh, yeah, food soil web, or soil food web. Uh, her, work's, her work's really interesting. And she was the one that really started playing around a lot with um, rock dust and kelp, or the two things that she, she kept going back to in terms of all her experiments, in terms of things that really help um, steer in the direction of, of beneficial biology in your soil. Um, all right, talked about bedding. Um, let's talk about housing. Your first worm bin should be one you make yourself. If it works well for you, go buy one. We don't sell them here, unfortunately, but you can get really nice stacking worm bins online. Um, there's some benefits to those. Um, I, I have, it's really hard to make a DIY tray method with interlocking trays, but any of the, they're usually green rectangular trays. I almost brought one this morning and I, I forgot to, so I apologize for that. Um, the reason I really like the tray method is it makes it really, really easy to harvest the worm castings that are more or less complete and add in new stuff at any given time because you can just create a new tray and add it into the stack and the worms can migrate up and down through all the holes in the bottom of each tray. That said, the very first one, they're not cheap, uh, the very first one you make should be one you make yourself, and you can do it out of basically any plastic tote that is opaque. So you don't want a translucent material, you want to make sure it's opaque. Um, There's some of those things, like totes you would get from big box, like Walmart, that uh, let in more light than you think they do. So make sure, you know, hold it up to the light, make sure it's really blocking out most of the light. So you, what you don't want is you don't want algae and stuff starting to grow on the inside wall. Uh, of your bin. Um, and just a small tote is fine. Um, you'll want to drill a lot of small holes around the top as well as around the bottom. And then wherever you have it in the shady part of your yard, again, it really needs to be in shade. If you have it in lots of sun, the worms will just kind of cook. They'll get way too hot. Um, not to mention in the colder months, um, it, they'll, be, they'll be more cold unless it's sheltered. Again, under a tree or in the shade of a courtyard, house, patio is a great place to keep them. Um, now, the small holes on top are kind of breathing holes. We're talking really small. And the reason why you want those, those holes to be small is you don't want um, a lot of fungus gnats getting in and out. Um, Who's familiar with fungus gnats? Yeah. How small? I don't have a, a measure of it, but not more than about a millimeter. An alternate, and this is a little bit of a hack that I've done with really good success, and you're, you're probably familiar with this if you're in the mycology world, is you can drill larger holes and then use this spongy craft material called polyfill and use those which function like, like lungs. It'll let gas exchange, air goes in and out. Um, so you can also do like polyfill kind of hole filters at top. But you, your bin needs to breathe because you're gonna have the lid on. You don't wanna keep the lid off. It'll dry out too fast. And then uh, all kinds of critters you don't want getting in are gonna get in. Cheesecloth works really well for you. Oh, cheesecloth, yeah. Good suggestion. Yeah. How about the holes on the bottom? How big? Holes on the bottom can be bigger. Okay. Um, I would say usually like quarter inch. And the worms won't leave? Well, so here's the other thing. You're not gonna leave your bin on, on the ground directly. Um, I like to lift it up on bricks. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want it just off the ground, if you do, the, the worms will absolutely migrate. They'll, I mean, unless, if you're keeping them really happy, they'll probably stick around. Um, and you want to be able to keep the lid on too, just for a whole host of reasons. It'll help kind of regulate the, the, whole, the whole environment. Um, and if you're doing just a single tub method, um, what I recommend doing is the very first time you get started, lay down a single ply newspaper at the very bottom. Because until you get the composty stuff kind of all sticking together, um, it's because a lot of the, these bacteria that are going to end up living in the worm compost, they release exudates, which is kind of this glue that glues everything together in a nice way. And that's one of the reasons why you, why you get this nice kind of crumbly texture to the fresh worm castings. Um, you want to lay down a sheet of newspaper on top, or sorry, on the bottom, fill it with your bedding material, and then dig in um, some food scraps. Um, this 
By the way, if you need worms and you get them here, there's some excellent instructions on here. I agree with like 99% of them. Uh, and it, it, it's kind of like the, the short notes for this class. There's one thing I do disagree with, which is I've always added just the whole bag to my worm enclosure right away whenever I ever started fresh. It says add worms gradually. And it's like, they're gonna be happy to get out of this bag into a, into a better environment. So how big a container would you put that bag over? Um, something like a 40 quart or so tote, yeah. You don't need a really deep tote because if you're doing them out of plastic totes that you're modifying yourself, you don't, I've tried creating stacking bins and it just doesn't work well. And so you're, you're essentially, you're only gonna be one deep. So kind of something that's rectangular, it's probably about twice as wide as it is uh, wide and tall, it's ideal. And then the thing that is true is you don't wanna feed too much at once. So you'll notice as you start digging through your bin, the rate at which your worms are helping break everything down. And so you can actually overfeed your worms. You can also underfeed them. They're okay. They're better being underfed than overfed. The other thing um, that you'll notice is the volume of food they eat varies a lot with temperature, which is to say they eat a lot less in the cooler months, and they eat a lot more during the warmer months. Their metabolism speeds up, and you're able to feed them more during the warmer months. I mean, I don't use trays. Uh -huh. The blue bin behind you. How much those are? Those might actually be Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, if you could get a lid for them, that would work fine. Um, let's see what we got. Yeah, as long as you were able to start, put some kind of lid on it, and it's flat enough that you could just put like a flat piece of plastic on it. Yours for $19.99. Yeah, that's pretty sturdy. Something like this, the nice thing about if it is intended as a pot, it's going to be a thick enough plastic that it's opaque enough not to cause the algae growth like I was talking about. And also UV resistant. So that's the other thing to keep in mind. If you're making your own totes, not all plastics are made out of UV resistant materials. So some of them, even outdoors, even if they're in the shape, will start to break down and get the brittle plastic that just falls apart everywhere. So opt for something that's gonna hold up. Um, now if you do the single tub method, which is how I started, usually I'll start feeding on one side and this is the other reason why you want kind of like rectangular. You could also do it kind of triple long. But I'll start feeding on one side and then I'll start feeding more, kind of mixing more food in as I feed them from one side to another. And by the time the worms migrate with the new food source, you can harvest from the other end and add in more bedding. And then go back and forth and back. So that's, it's not quite as clean as like a, a stacking tray method where you basically just get a whole tray at once of worm castings, um, but it's a good it's a good way to get started with just a single tub. Um, if you ever get fungus gnats, another trick for keeping fungus gnats down is you can keep a single ply of newspaper on the very top inside of your bin. Especially if you have like a spray bottle or something where you can wet it down, you can make it so it really like kind of covers the surface, but the fungus gnats can't get in to lay eggs and kind of break the larval cycle there. So once you stop. Generally, yeah, unless they're living somewhere else. Um, so the, the life cycle of fungus gnats, the adults have a short cycle where they fly around, but they need to return to soil to lay eggs. And so if they can't get into soil, uh, since their larval cycle, the little, they're little white worms that basically live on uh, decomposing organic matter, similar to the worms we actually want to be growing. And so if you create a physical barrier, that's one of the best ways to get rid of fungus gnats. Um, for houseplants, another thing that you'll usually see recommended is like add a layer of mulch. We don't really want to do that on a worm bins because we don't want to be accidentally digging mulch into it. And that's where keeping a single layer of newspaper on top really helps. Um, another thing, if you, if you really can't control fungus gnats, this is worm safe. You can use the mosquito dunk stuff. You can actually just mix it in with your bedding. It's a biological larvicide. It's organic um, or it's, it's only listed in its other formulations. Um, but this is like, I would only recommend it if you can't get rid of it, but it won't, it's good to know it won't harm your, your worms. Yeah. A little, uh, like a shot glass of apple cider vinegar, like would that like attract them? Or you could use them as a trap, yeah. Okay. You could also use fly paper or like yellow sticky traps as a trap. You could even, there's probably enough, um, depending on how full your bin is, how large your bin is, you could even put something like one of those hanging traps or yellow sticky traps on the inside bin versus on the outside of your bin. 
that's where, unless you have like some kind of um, cheesecloth or polyfill, like larger breathing holes on top, um, <clears throat> you really wanna make sure those upper holes are small. You want those holes for airflow, low to high airflow, but you don't want large holes. Um, we'll add it, we'll do a little more pest control stuff. You should never need to add these into your bins directly, but the one thing that, and it happens to me, I haven't found a better method. No matter what, I always get some slugs in my worm bins. Yes. Throw some sluggo around. Um, I don't have issues with, um, roly polies can be tolerated in small amounts, even in your bins, they're really not harmful. Um, I don't have an issue with earwigs in my bins, but if you did, that'd be the difference between using Sluggo Plus and Sluggo. And again, you would want to put this around your bin on the outside, not in your bin. Got it. But the, the yeah. slug won't be any harmful, right? If you have them in there? Uh, the slugs aren't going to necessarily impact the quality of the worm castings. It's more just the slugs are not good to have in your garden because they eat plants. But if they yeah. just hang out in there, just leave it, right? Kind of, they're kind of gross too, but yeah, you're right. There's no, there's no, there's not like an intrinsic problem that just right. having a few slugs hanging around. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me I recall something I knew was was doing the worm thing, and they got ants in the worm What do you recommend? Yeah, ants will actually. Some of the carnivorous ants will actually eat worms. They'll attack the worms. Um, I always I recommend these. I recommend these in all applications around the garden. Um, these are kind of for spot treatment, and these ones are better for more like permanent insulation. Same active ingredient, it's basically sugar, water, and borax. Um, these also work best if they're in shady areas. So if you put them out in full sun, they're less attractive to the ants. What these do is especially the ants, like Argentine ants and other traveling ants that are the ones that cause all kinds of mischief on your plants by farming aphids and other yeah. sap sucking bugs. This is a form of sap to them. And the major difference between this and the sap, so it's initially an ant attractant, but what makes these so effective compared to some of the other uh, harsher chemical controls is that there's trace amounts of borax in this, which they will bring droplets of the, the fake honeydew back to their colony and eventually feed the queen, which causes the colony to collapse. A lot of the other more poisonous ant poisons um, are effective at killing the individual ants and not good at taking out the colonies. And the reason why is all of those uh, army ants that are just there scavenging for food to bring back to their colony, insofar as they see them, the army ants dying, they know something's up, and then they stop bringing things back. They don't have time to bring it back to the queen ant. So the reason why the sugar water borax traps are highly effective is the, at some point after initially attracting the ants, you'll see them like drown in these traps and that kind of thing, but eventually they're gonna bring some of that back to the, the queen and that causes the colony to collapse. And you said those are safe to put around the garden? Yeah. Even if it's a smaller garden? Because I read somewhere that they, they don't recommend those for a garden area. It's borax and sugar water. Um, even, they're not gonna say pet safe on it, but if you had a dog ingest it, it'd probably give them really bad diarrhea okay. or make them vomit because of the borax, which is a strong detergent in it. But that's, it's, not, um, it's not carcinogenic, it's not harsh poison, it's just by virtue of the borax that kills the ants, yeah. Do you spray that on the plants or do you- No, these are, these are bait traps. Oh, bait. They're traps. liquid bait traps, so you're actually putting these in stations and okay. it will attract the ants to them. Similar to these are bait traps, okay. as these are little granules that attract uh, slugs and snails, they come and eat them, they die. Mm. Same thing here. Okay. These attract ants to them, ants eat the material, and they die. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is in, when you're using your worm castings, when you're harvesting it, uh, I've made my own tray, but it's good to have something to sift, and also learning on the behavior of worms so you can actually um, extract worm castings without extracting all your worms with it. I actually deliberately, especially during the warmer months when I'm using worm castings around my garden, um, I'll harvest worm castings with some worms in it and I'll actually top dress my plants or make soil mixes with some living worms in it. But I don't mind losing a few worms to the cause because again, they're reproducing in my worm bin at a rate that I know I can afford to lose a few. Um, but worms, essentially, when you open up your bin, especially if they're crawling on top, you'll see them dive deep. And so that's one of, one of the arguments for having the tray method, one of the, getting one of the fancy worm farms with the multiple trays, it makes it a little easier um, to harvest them. But essentially, if you start unstacking the trays, you'll notice the worms dig deeper into the soil, and then 
especially if you leave them out for a little while, the worms are going to dig as deep as possible. And so usually the top layer is the start, the part you want to harvest. Unless you have something like this, and this you can actually sift worm castings through it. A few worms might fall through it, but more or less, and the worm eggs will fall through it, and you want that, because again, anytime you're then top dressing your plants with worm castings you make yourself, you're actually adding eggs, meaning you'll get worms living where there weren't before, unlike there are no living eggs in these. Still, still a good product, but that's one of the major benefits of your own worm uh, castings, is fresh worm castings, even without worms in it, still has the potential to create living worms in your garden. Um, so coming up with some method to sift, sometimes what I'll do is I'll throw a lot of the worm castings in a five gallon bucket and I'll go around my garden and I'll just grab handfuls from the top of the bucket and the worms will dig deeper and deeper down and then rather than emptying the bucket out when, I, when I'm done hitting the plants that I want with the worm castings, I'll just go back and pour that back into my worm bin. You can dig them in. You you you're gonna get a benefit if you have like mulch raised beds or something. You'd want to scrape aside the mulch and dig in a little bit. Um, I use it a lot when I'm making soil mixes, like when I'm mixing up some soil to pot up things. Um, and frequently, if I'm repotting something, even in a lot of my like tomato containers and stuff, I grow a lot of tomatoes in 15 gallon pots. Uh, I'll do soil, worm castings, mulch layer. So you're gonna have a better impact using your worm castings if you're, um, if it's not just sitting on top of the soil baking in the sun, because it's gonna dry out then. Another thing I'll also frequently do is I'll water it in. So wherever I'm laying down the worm castings, I'll go around with the hose or a watering <coughs> bucket and use that to kind of help work it into the soil a little bit. But yeah, if you have hard, like hard native soil that you're trying to use worm castings, you'd probably wanna get a little trowel and actually dig it in around the plant. For your for your worm, how sh how big should the holes be for your worm tray for your bin? I usually like quarter inch, which is still pretty small. I, I have used a quarter inch drill bit in the past. And again, the reason why the worms aren't all going to leave is because you have it up on bricks, it's suspended up on bricks. You will notice like little piles of worm castings coming out of the bottom of your tray, so you can have some kind of you know flat something, or it's just falling in the ground and making more worms in the ground nearby. Like one layer of bricks is enough? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, one, one should be good. So the cheese crop is put on top of that and fold, right? You could, you could, or when you start off your bin, use a, a, sing, a single ply of newspaper. And that, that way, again, you're probably always gonna lose a little bit. The, the commercial worm farms that they sell, uh, it's a, it has feet in the bottom layer. It's got little plastic feet. It's actually got a spigot. There's like a spout that turns on and off, and the bottom layer has like a, a thicker plastic mesh. So they make it kind of fancy. It's, it's a little bit more convenient. Um, if you have just a regular, uh, the other thing I've done is I've done tote inside a tote. So I'll get a bigger plastic tote, put bricks in the bottom of that, and then put a tote inside of that that has holes. Again, some of the worm castings are going to spill through, but you want it to be able to breathe from the bottom. Yeah. You don't you don't want the last thing you want, and and so if your worm bins are ever getting too dry, so a lot of the moisture you're adding, your bedding should be wet, so if you're adding cocoa, it should be wet. I usually add slightly most co moist cocoa with dry, you know, dry-ish leaf material with dry paper, and a lot of the moisture that is added to your worm bins is in the form of the food scraps that you're adding. But if your worm bins are ever getting too dry, uh, it's another reason why you want holes in the bottom of your worm trays is because you can then just take a watering can and water over the top. Uh, sorry, dry leaf litter, and what else? The, the, um, I, do, I do equal parts cocoa bar that's already been expanded, uh, newspaper or paper shreds, and leaf litter from an oak tree. Okay. Some other tree, kind of tree we can find. Sure. Yeah. We only really have pine needles. Could we do half cocoa bar and half paper? Yeah. Or That'll you, absolutely work. What if you reach the pine needles first, of like like trying to get all that antimicrobial stuff out through the water, like by, by soaking it, draining, it, soaking it, draining, it, soaking it, draining. It. it might work. It sounds like a lot of work to me. I would, I would, if I were you and you have a, a lot of access to pine needles, you probably would never want it to be a major constituent of your bedding. But I would consider adding in a little bit and just 
as an experiment once you have a healthy tray and see if they even break down at all. There's probably, you probably wouldn't want to go more than like five or 10%, but I would at least try it and see if they break down. And if they're not breaking down, that's your indication that you shouldn't be using them. And then you just, you know, if you're harvesting your workouts and just throw out whatever's not breaking down. What kind of shirt paper do you use? Because I've tried, I've used bleach white paper for that, and it's killed my following out on the specific way or not. So I kind of, I use nothing but carbon like that. But do, do you, I'm wondering, do you, because you put it in the coke pool and you put it in the, the mic does look a little bit. But. Oh, I have a paper shredder. So it's everything from, it's mostly stuff that's been printed out of my printer that I don't so, need anymore. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't usually use stuff from the mail. I used to, and I'm, I just a lot of the, the mailer stuff. It's either too cardboardy and doesn't seem to break down well. It's like too thick. It's cardstock, or it's too thin and doesn't shred through the paper shredder properly. If you have a paper shredder at home, any kind of like just stuff on regular printer paper. I noticed, like when you just said paper, that, yeah. I was using like white printer paper. Uh huh. Like I said, it killed. Whether it was that or something else, but I noticed it killed my coffee. So I I haven't had that problem. That's interesting to know. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing, uh, as I was talking about keeping your, your bin wet enough, again, this is really easy and convenient to do if you have one of the fancy worm bins, but you can do it with your DIY one as well. The easy way to make compost tea is, one, it's funny because I was reading a, a gardening book and the author is all about working with nature and biological gardening, and she goes into, she has a thing about why make compost tea, it's a lot of work, all the benefits of the worm casting, just to add the worm casting to your soil, you get all the benefit there you'll get compost tea when it rains, essentially. Um, but a really awesome and easy way to harvest, uh, kind of like the, the lazy person's compost tea, is if you ever need to hydrate your worm, uh, your worm bin, if you, have, if you have some kind of catch tray underneath it and you just water it over the top with a watering bucket, collect any of the water that drips through the bottom side, that stuff is great to use, and then you can just go around and hit your plants with that. It's a really good inoculant. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Oh, sure. But you can't get a foliar spray if you put it in the soil. So. Oh, sure. Because you're doing foliar spray on your plants. Awesome. Because it prevents leaf rot, prevents fungal infection. Because you have that like, competing bacteria and rhizomes and everything. So that's why I do That's awesome. Yeah, and that, that's those. Little, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, one of the major reasons to have good biology in your soil, it doesn't just keep the soil working for you, but it really helps guard against pathogens. It's when there's a vacuum of living things in your soil that it invites pathogenic uh, microbes and fungi, et cetera. And so the same would be true on the outside of the plants as well. So um, what are you, how are you straining before you do foliar feed? So it's, that's how it's the reason I came with yeah. the best way at heart, because I literally end up murdering worms trying to Not intentionally. Yeah, Not intentionally. Yeah. 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 I'm trying not to do that. So I was trying to, what's the best way to harvest them and getting the worms out? Some kind of sifting tray is honestly the best. But even like this, if you were to let them, they would slowly crawl through the bottom of this. So it's going to be, it's you're going to kind of need to do a speed thing where you're grabbing a handful, going like this, and then getting rid of the worms and doing get just like shaking it a little bit. And a lot of the castings will get through. You won't get them all, and then you'll still salvage most of the worms that way. Usually, I just take the top of my coat and I put it in the pile. So uh -huh. in the sun, they can go to the bottom. Yeah. But even then, that doesn't. You'll, you'll always get a few, when you're making your own world castings, you'll always get a few stragglers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who has a container for his garden, and he gets um, the pots that he usually are the default ones that when you buy, he puts that in the ground. He does a little composting yeah. right there on the spot, and he's, it's rich in worms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that method. I haven't tried it myself. Um, I've seen it highly recommended from a lot of good sources. And so yeah, to elaborate, what she's what she's saying is you grab something like an old nursery pot, like a, a one gallon or something. And frequently what they'll do is um, they, they either have large drainage holes, or I've sometimes seen where you actually cut out the bottom, and you'd be feeding basically food scraps directly into a hole of a submerged pot that's sitting in your raised beds or in your garden. The idea being that worms will come and snag the decaying food and then bring it and distribute it directly into your garden. Um, I haven't tried it personally, so I can't speak to it. Uh, it's clever. It's certainly clever, and I, I think it works. My only concern would be, I have a lot of critters. This is one of the reasons why I don't compost outside, besides the fact that it's more work and I make better compost. He's got a lid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, because I, I get a lot of like raccoons and other really, uh, really clever critters that will go digging through compost piles. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sure. Well, you, so, however it is that you've set up your own tubs, and that's clever. You, I have seen with five-gallon buckets before. Again, you'd want to opt for one of the more opaque ones. The orange Home Depot ones are fairly translucent. But um, and, and it, so I will I will show this because this is one of the improvements. I ended up getting my own like kind of fancy warm stacking warm tray online, uh, which again I can highly recommend. But if you're making your own, consider drilling only one or two holes in the very bottom. And they're just putting more holes along the bottom, actually above where the soil, where the compost level will be. Any way you slice it, you need holes in the very, very bottom. Otherwise, even with if you're not adding moisture, as all of the vegetable matter breaks down, it'll add moisture into your system, and then you get um, just standing liquid at the bottom, which is is going to cause problems because it, it is anaerobic. You don't have anything mixing it up or adding oxygen in the mix and whenever you have anaerobic conditions it invites anaerobic bacteria um, not all anaerobes are bad but generally anaerobic conditions favor more bad things than good things versus aerobic conditions air rich environment favors the good biology that we're looking for in our soil so yeah you need some kind of hole in the very very bottom so that even if you were to like you know pour a whole water bottle into your worm tray it should drain through the bottom So that would be, you've inadvertently created a hot compost pile, right? And so, yeah, if you add too much, that's another argument in why we have, you know, if you're doing a, an aerobic composting pile where you're actually turning the pile outside without worms, um, you don't need bedding material. Bedding is, not only is it a sponge that's gonna kind of keep the worms happy, but it's, it's kind of a substrate that where all the magic happens for the worms to break all this material down. And so if you just throw in tons and tons of food scraps, it will heat up because there's a high nitrogen content. And so then you're all these, the bacteria, it's the same bacteria, larger that would be breaking it down, but they basically get overactive and then you get a hot compost pile and the worms cook. And that happens, especially during the summer months, that's gonna happen more. Because if your ambient temperatures are hotter, then hot composting processes, it's easy to reach that threshold where you then get aerobic compost pile going, a thermophilic compost pile going. When that happens, it's going to heat up way too much for the worms. Is there any way to back out of that, like, starts? Just don't do it in the first place, I would say. Just oh, yeah. just be conscious about the rate at which you're feeding your worms. And so every time you go to feed your worms, check on it and see how the stuff that you've already added is breaking down. Just kind of raking through with your fingers. Yeah. Do you continue to add more core as you're using the yeah. system? Yeah, as you add more food scraps, you'll want to add more. The core in your final product, and that's another thing that's different than commercial worm casting, so this is really like all broken down stuff. Core will partially break down and you can still kind of recognize it. It's it's gonna give your finished product a little bit of like a, a granular kind of spongy texture to it. And it's awesome to have in your final product. Um, but because when you harvest your worm castings, you'll be harvesting whatever core, like the, the paper scraps, the leaf stuff, that will all actually break down. Um, the core will, will, will partially break down, but it'll kind of turn the color of worm castings. It'll be kind of a dark, kind of uh, rich color. Um, and so you will always need to be adding more of that. Thankfully, core is really cheap. And again, this, this one block will expand to like 
this big. It's super compressed. It'll, however big of a tub you think you need to expand if you go with one of these big bricks, get a bigger tub because otherwise it'll just overflow your tub when you expand it. They sell rice hull for bedding for horses. Have yeah. you tried using rice hull in place of pork? I have not. I have used, so rice hull is really interesting. I've used rice hull in soil mixes as an alternative to pumice or perlite because rice hulls are these kind of sharp, pointy, oblong, they're the size, it's slightly bigger than a grain of rice, right? They're, they're what was outside of rice, it's a byproduct of the rice industry. Um, and they're kind of like slightly curved shape, they're like canoe shaped. Um, so they're really good for aeration. The issue I've had um, with rice hulls in a soil mix is there's always a few grains of rice and I get grass, I get rice grass. I don't know how much of a problem that would be in a worm bin. If you have rice hulls, I'd try using some. Um, one of the arguments for rice hulls is they're really rich in silicates. So there's some plants that benefit from silica, silica strengthens cell walls. And this is actually another argument for using azomite. It's rich in silicates, the most volcanic byproducts are. But um, there's 11 essential plant nutrients and the 12th non-essential plant nutrient but that many plants benefit from is silica. And so that's an argument for using rice holes or things like um, volcanic rock dust. And so um, interestingly enough, they've done all kinds of trials, aside from making uh, sturdier stems on plants, um, one of the benefits of silica is it seems to uh, decrease predation by herbivores. So they've done side-by-sides where they feed silica to some crops and not others, and then see which ones the deer preferentially eat, and they'll preferentially eat the things that have less silica in them. So that's kind of an interesting note there. So I watched a video of, I've never done it before. I just use like the ground of eggshells, but as my or like silica sand. I yeah. saw the guy who takes silica sand and grows it in these bedding so the worms can like eat in their crop and chew up the do you recommend doing that or do you think this the I think so. I think that again if you were powderizing eggshells it probably some serve a similar purpose, but um, you know how you feed grits grit to chickens so that they can break down their food. There seems to be a benefit of having um, small, coarse, sharp particles, and this, at least as a minor constituent of it. And that's where um, I, I really like things like azomite and crab meal, if I had to pick two okay. here. Um, again, this is more commonly used, but this is gonna be like a powder, but it's it's really on a, if you were to zoom in on a micro microscope, be really, really sharp particles, and it seems like it kind of gets inside the worm's gullet and helps them kind of grind, grind up the breaking down stuff. Just, um, so I think it has a benefit. Um, I have a Lomi machine. I don't know if you know that. But it's like where it grinds up all the, the good stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I don't know if I can use that for worm casting. Because I have so much of that, because I keep grind, throwing stuff in there. What's the byproduct? What's it actually? It's composted. It's composted. It's, it's, like, like a, it's a tabletop composter that it uses heat. It actually does like a, a hot compost. Oh, sure. Like yeah. And then the bot, like the leftover, is ready to go compost with. So you, you could use that as an input, almost like, a, like an inoculant. Uh, or bedding material, but you would still need to be adding in food for the worms because by the time it's in that composted form, there's not a ton for the worms to eat. Gotcha. And you of course need to make sure it's fully composted and cooled down already. Right. And so that the worms can continue to live in their own, uh, in the vermicompost for a while. Uh, and that's where underfeeding has not usually ever been a big problem for me. If I go out of town for a week or two, uh -huh. like the worms can kind of sustain themselves. And that's because they're not feeding the foods off the food scraps directly, they're feeding off the bacteria and other microbes that are breaking that down, which continue to remain in the vermicompost for you know a long time after it's starting to break down. Okay. So but yeah, you could use that, you could definitely add that in. I would at least add it in at, at very least as a minor constituent for like, hey, this is because whatever you, you need to get all that stuff in the system. Yeah in order for, you know, there's naturally microbes all over banana peels and cucumber peels and apple cores and all that stuff. There's, it's, the microbes are gonna break the stuff down no matter what, but if you think there's a really good thing that has biology to it, by all means add some of it into your worm bin. So not to get off on the tangent yeah. of composting, but black soldier flat for us. I do black soldier flat. Sure. But mostly just to break down these two and all the stuff that I don't want. 
Could you use that into the world? You absolutely could. In fact, for us, it's going to be really similar to these. It's primarily chitin, with I think there's some poop material left behind from insects. And so that was one of the reasons why I started, um, like in, in frass became, insect frass became this big thing in like kind of a leaf growing for certain cash crops. And I did a little, some research on it and people were doing side by sides with crab meal and getting the same results from the benefits of frass. If you're making your own, use it. I've always found it to be too expensive to justify the cost when something like crab meal is like a fraction of the cost and it seems to have the same benefits. If you have free insect frass, that would be awesome to have in your worm bins, yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about the worms? Sure. I mean, can you use any kind of worms or only special worms? Uh, you, you can use, the major worms are going to be European night crawlers, they, which I think are the same as what they, they mark as red wrigglers. So we can use garden No, they're different? Uh, we can talk extensively about different types of worms, but European night crawlers and red wrigglers. Red wrigglers are from the northwest. Okay. Mostly top composters. Okay. And your night crawlers will go dip down deeper. Which, which do you use? Because I, I just want pure uh, top composters, I'll use red wrigglers. But if you want to put it back into your garden, you want night crawlers. The regular ones will die. I see. Thank you. Garden worms that we already have yeah, and start out with that? Or do you have to buy worms that are uh, different? Or? I don't see why you couldn't use what you're digging out. So, uh, are, so yeah. there's three different types of worms. You have your top composters, your middle earth, and they all have three things that I forgot. And then you get your deep birds. The ones that come up to the surface are those middle, middle ones, mostly because native worms kind of been pushed out. Most of them are, are European night colors. There's like 2,000 here in San Diego. Um, the ones you pull out of your garden or out of the ground don't compost as much. They like to go down in the center and make pockets. And they're the ones that actually aerate. So if you have raised beds, those are perfect because it prevents your raised beds from becoming anaerobic and it constantly turns them. If you're doing just compost and all you want is compost, you want red wigglers out of the bag because they stay at the surface, they eat compost, their whole purpose in life is to compost, leaf litter, and... Can you mix them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if these, if these, I don't think they stay on them, like you're saying they're probably red wigglers. 95%. I know um, if you want to source the night crawlers, I think that's one of the ones that they use as fishing lures a lot. They're larger worms. So you can always go to like a tackle shop and get some European night crawlers. No, they're labeled as such if they're that. Yeah, I think the, I, I don't know this vendor. I know the, the gentleman that used to supply us with worms had, he claimed it was a blend of three different types of worms. I don't know what the third kind is. I'm assuming it was the other two that we were just discussing. So, so yeah. The, the, the main, the main uh, like constituents uh, for this, if I just wanted to, also go the extra mile with the nutrients and just add. Um, so it's the crab meal as my post um, pork slash horse manure, or um, and then, and then um, like dry leaf litter and um, uh, uh, new chaser and worms. Yeah. Okay, so that's all. The other what are you going to check about the horse manure? Oh, and organic matter. Like well. Yeah, exactly. That's really what's food, uh, food for the worms. What are you going to check about the horse manure before using it? Uh, that if they've been fed ivermectin? Yeah, make sure they haven't been treated with deworming agent. Where are you dropping What's that? Where are you dropping the horse manure? Or to get it? Uh, I got yeah. Uh, yeah, if you have friends in Ramona, you have more than enough horse manure. There's also, there's also these, uh, down here in Garden Road, there's these, um, um, uh, horse ranches, stables. right? Stables, stables, stables where, where people will, will house their horses, right? And uh, you can go there, and they will be more than willing to let you. Yeah, you know, you can walk out there with two five-gallon buckets that you can carry. Yeah, but a lot of people use ivermectin, so you really need to be careful about that. You, you need to know the source of the horse manure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what if you boiled it? Would it get rid of the? No. So the ivermectin, it's got about a six, three to six month life. You know, you believe it. Three to six month life. So if you let it sit out, it's a little. I've heard, yeah, I've heard you can use really well composted horse manure as an input and not worry as much about it. So, on that topic, but if, if, if there is substantial amount of ivermectin left over, other than they don't look nice, they are not gonna, they're, the composters will break stuff down. They'll compete a little bit with the worms. What I notice is, especially black flies, they make the compost hot and kill. 
they make a cup of hot. Like that's really hot, like hot. Yeah, it's, yeah. Physically hot. Unless there's other questions. Thank you all for, oh uh, yeah? Um, I, uh, I'm looking um, at my thing here saying, um, and it says, uh, uh, ch chitinase. Um, yeah. Chitinase is, is uh, made by a ba bacteria, or is that a byproduct of, of chitinase? Because Yes. So chitinase is an enzyme that certain bacteria, and when we say bacteria, we mean all kinds of microbes. It includes archaea, which we don't usually talk about. But it's basically microbes will produce chitinase to break down chitin. So it's, it's special classes of bacteria that can feed off of exoskeleton shell, and they produce that enzyme to break it down. Okay. Uh, and uh, can I use a translucent tote and make it okay? I don't. I don't see why not. What matters is that light's not getting in it. That's going to be the important part. Yeah. I, th I think she has a question. Um, yeah. So that's the thing. You don't. Practically speaking, you should. Um, yeah. So any kind of compost tea or warm tea that you're making, um, essentially what it is 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 you're inoculating soil with beneficial microbes, and. Um, it's less that you're concerned about burning your plants and more that you want to dilute it because the more you dilute it, the more you're able to spread it to more plants. So it's, it's um, yeah, you want to dilute it enough that you can hit all the plants that you want to hit. Um, I'm on a well, so my water is not chlorinated. So the only other thing to consider is there's lots of chlorine and chloramines added to tap water. It makes our water safe to drink. Um, the, if you're concerned about that, that's why you might not want to be diluting it with like tap water right out of the tap versus um, one of the things you'll see recommended for making compost tea um, if, if you're on tap water with chlorine in it is that you can just leave the bucket out for a day or if you have an air stone and you're doing the bubbling method. But a lot of it, especially if, it's, if water's left out in the sun, that's going to cause a lot of the chlorine and chloramines to uh, basically gas off. They'll dissipate. Chlor chloramines are more stubborn to escape the water than chlorine. But um, leaving water just out overnight or really in the sun for a day um, can mitigate that. Um, or use rain water. Or use rain water. Yeah, rain water would work great. Chloramines won't gas off. You use absorbic acid. Absorbic acid will neutralize it. Okay. You can use a sulfur addict like Gibson, you don't do it. Or do it in, like I do, because I'm lazy. Get an inline uh, carbon filter off of Amazon and run around your clothes and then get all your stuff. Interesting. Is scorbic acid like just vitamin C powder? Interesting. It's good to know. Noted. Sulfur too, like I said, Gibson. You take a little, oh, okay. I got a five gallon bucket, a little thing of Gibson, take it and mix it up. It's going to make it more acidic. Right. Which, first, depending on the plants, like uh, blueberries, is great. Sure. Good to know. Um, uh, I was uh, I wanted to uh, on, on the topic of compost tea. Can you go over just really quick, one by one more time. I, I think I, I missed it. Uh, uh, the process for compost tea is a little bit unrelated. My apologies. So. And the second question, um, the, the single tub rectangular tech. Can you also go over that a little bit, like how you're moving from one end to end, and like what you know is the hardest is actually like me. I I I. I Sure, yeah, yeah, I'll do the, I'll answer that in reverse order. So if you're doing the one tub method, you'll basically know it's ready to harvest if you're not seeing identifiable veggie scraps. And if the stuff you added in the form of veggie scraps or paper aren't there anymore. It should look like any other compost, essentially. Um, and the trick there is just making sure that you're feeding from one end of the bin to the other. So as you're adding in more food, kind of from one side to the other, you can kind of check and see how the areas that you've already, like at any point you can kind of dig through it. You don't want to mix all of the fresh stuff with the more um, aged stuff because the aged stuff is ready to harvest and you don't want to mix it all together all the time because you want to be able to harvest it to make more room. But essentially you'll notice, you'll see that it's broken down. The worms, the worms will do all of the tilling. That's one of the beauties. 
So you're really just working from end to end of the tub. When you hit one end of the tub, you go back to the other. You, you, yeah, if you're seeing, oh, hey, this is a half broken down banana peel, that's not warm castings yet. It's on its way to becoming warm castings. Um, so that is just kind of like, does it look like compost? Does it look like the things that I added to it have broken down? Um, and then in terms of the, the simple composty recipe, um, again, you, you ideally want to get rid of chlorine and chloramines as possible. Um, you'll want a five gallon bucket. You'll fill it about two to three gallons. It might overflow, it might bubble over, but that's a good sign. It means you have a lot of biological activity. So you'll fill it with about two gallons of water, then you'll get an old gym sock. You'll throw about a cup of worm castings in it and about a quarter cup of kelp meal. And then uh, you need an air stone. You need some kind of aerator or bubbler. You could actually just have a tube, but air stone's better because the smaller the airs are, the, the air bubbles are, the more of that dissolved air is actually gonna end up in the water. So keep in mind that liquids can hold on to gases. Gases are soluble in water. They're more soluble in water when the water's cold. So if that's one, argument against, and also the, the air bubbling through is going to kind of stir up the whole thing, but if your water temps are really, really hot, the solubility of gas, curb, and, and liquids decreases pretty dramatically. So ideally you're shooting, if like it's the summer months, you might want to make compost tea at night when your ambient temps are cooler, because if it's like above 90 degrees, then there's less oxygen sticking around in the water. Um, and so essentially you're just two gallons of water, about a cup of worm castings, and about a quarter cup of kelp meal in a sock. Kelp meal is optional, but highly recommended. And then you want about a quarter cup of molasses, unsulfured blackstrap molasses that you get off the kitchen of, of the grocery store. And you want to stir that in and dissolve it in directly into the water. And the other ingredients go in a sock and you just tie the sock off. And then uh, you let it bubble for anywhere from about 12 to 24 hours. You'll notice it's working because you'll see a bacterial slime and kind of bubble monster starting to form. And if you do water with it, because you'll end up with these kind of floating chunks of bacterial snot, if you water with it and using a watering bucket, you'll probably want to sieve it through some kind of filter first. Um, and what works well is just like a, like a rice strainer or a pasta strainer or some kind of colander from a kitchen. Um, obviously, you probably don't want to then use it in your kitchen again after that. But if you have something for that purpose, where it's, it's just kind of like a, a metal filter because um, in the past I've clogged up some, some things including hoses and stuff with pumps before by getting those little bacterial snot chunks in there. <laughs> yeah. I got some from Compost Tea Lab, it's yeah. a scientific calculation of it, but it gives you what he wants and I, can, I always keep it on my phone. Oh sure. But it gives you breakdowns and you can like from frass to regular compost to compost tea from worms to like look at this. People get really elaborate with them. And I used to have really elaborate corn uh, or compost tea recipes. Another optional, if you have crab meal, you can throw in about a quarter cup or so of crab meal. So I mean, especially if you're trying to boost natural plant immunity, uh, you're, getting, you're either anticipating pest problems or you're getting tagged by bugs. The molasses is a, is a food source for the bacteria, only if you're doing compost tea, different than doing the worm bin. So this is just a, one of many ways that you can use your worm ca castings is by making your own compost tea. And of course, even if you're making like two gallons of tea or so, you'll still want to dilute it. And that's mostly just so that you can spread around your garden more efficiently. Yeah, it's, exactly yeah. it's a sugar and also has a lot of um, uh, nutrients in it. It's a more slightly more complex sugar than like white granular sugar. And so it's slightly more difficult for the bacteria to feed on, but in a good way. Yeah, exactly. Grocery store. Yeah, molasses. Yeah. Amazon. It's really thick, viscous substance. So it's a little bit of a pain in the butt. Well, thank you guys all. Um,